faculty at sanmed are always at the forefront of organizing knowledge updating sessions and look forward for each of you to participate and have a meaningful participation in the session and at the same time for today's session is been moderated by dr ranga reddy who is popularly known as dr ranga across ipc speciality so he would be moderating the session and to precisely introduce him dr ranga reddy is a physician a public health specialist and is a social entrepreneur with interest in business verticals which has high social impact dr ranga reddy is a health policy enthusiast focused on public health awareness education and training he is committed to the improvement of patient safety in india and other low resource settings he is as uh, is a he graduated from means government of medical institute medical institute belarus with a degree of md general medicine and subsequently he did his pg diploma in management of pondicherry university and advanced management uh, from iesc barcelona spain with the specialization in strategy and business development and dr rangareddy is the founder of, of a founder trustee of infection control academy of india which is popularly known as ifkai a non profit initiative create infection prevention capacity for india and emerging countries in recognition to his public health leadership skills he was invited by university of hyderabad and institute of eminence to impart his knowledge and experience in the capacity of honorary professor his effort has trans translated into catering several long term programs in ipc segment he also supports several non profit organizations in the capacity of advisor so thank you thank you for being the moderator for the session and now i will hand over the session to you thank you so much dr nero panda for being a speaker for the session thank you so much sir all yours now thank you very much uh, mr ganesh uh, for that uh, introduction and kind words uh, colleagues a warm welcome to all of you to the season 5 of the master class glad to see uh, many of the old friends colleagues and uh, i also see many of the new faces who are tuning into this very important session from all over the world hope you had um, a great festive time and i hope sincerely hope that uh, you are slowly recovering from the fatigue of non stop covid duties <clears throat> with constantly being in uh, ppe and in complete or partial isolation i take this opportunity um, at the beginning of this uh, uh, session 5 to salute all those covid warriors and many of them as we know are the infection preventionists who have risked their lives to save many in the world not only in india lmic but across the world you look at any country i think you know the tremendous efforts a uh, very sincere and committed efforts which were made by the infection preventionists has made this world a little better and also you know to come out of this uh, covid-19 uh, their efforts are uh, applaudable and also you know uh, there are no parallels probably in the history uh, i take this opportunity also to thank uh, university of hyderabad and uh, the sanmed healthcare for prolonging this festive season because we had series of uh, different festivals of various uh, religions of the world and now you know both these um, uh, eminent organizations that is you know university of hyderabad and sanmed have given us the opportunity to prolong that festive season with at another festival a festival of infection prevention and control knowledge sharing it is almost 2 uh, <clears throat> years since uh, the infection prevention and control master classes are the popularly no known by now uh, at least uh, in the asia africa gulf and uh, latin america as ipc master classes uh, have started and happy to see the kind of response it has evoked and continue to be a major event for ipc professionals in india and other countries several thousand people uh, have attended or reviewed the video material or the presentations from previous sessions uh, all the four of them and we are delighted to get a overwhelming positive feedback 
which has actually helped us to uh, go ahead with at another season. The successful past sessions have certainly uh, raised probably the expectations and also the bar. Uh, I am sure the sessions of the current season are also going to be meeting uh, your expectations. Uh, delighted to welcome all of you to back to the IPC Masterclass Season 5, which is titled as Prioritizing Evidence-Based Infection Prevention Measures for Improving Quality Care. Just to set the tone for this series, now, after the COVID havoc, uh, you know, everyone probably would agree that infection prevention and control is an essential foundation for quality universal health coverage. As probably you would all know that uh, in October 2018, all countries of the world have gathered in Astana, Kazakhstan to reaffirm and expand their commitment to prioritize, to promote, and also to protect the health and well-being of the of their populations. You know, since uh, 1978, when the first time Alma Atta declaration was done, many countries have designed health systems that improve access to quality essential services, social stability, health security, as well as having economic benefits. Having said all that, quality of health services are increasingly emphasized as an essential factor for success of our healthcare and healthcare institutions. Infection prevention and control as an evidence-based uh, approach is core of this quality movement, which I talked about in order to halt the spread of infections and also the silent pandemic the antimicrobial resistance. IPC, you know, if you broadly look at, it embodies all three core domains of the quality care. That is care that is safe, effective, and people-centered. That is the most important thing. Because at the end of the day, it is the patient who is the most important in the whole spectrum of the healthcare provision. And Definitely, it strongly supports the attainment of other key global health priorities that eventually contribute to high quality universal health care. I am sure you would agree with me that strong IPC capacity and programs ensure adequate preparedness and response to protect people from outbreaks. Their reinforcement is an essential pillar for recovery and health system strengthening after the shock of an epidemic like COVID-19. IPC is also uh, a complementary to and enhance, you know, WASH interventions. You know, uh, as we know that you know, WASH monitors infrastructure indicators. Uh, whereas IPC provides evidence of an effect on healthcare workers, their behavior, and also the patient outcomes through improved infrastructures. IPC strategies, which are aimed at reducing antimicrobial resistance, are particularly effective due to the synergy you know, which they have. Combining both of them, that is IPC interventions with AMR programs, is the most effective approach in order to deal with the quality improvement within the healthcare system. IPC interventions like you know hand hygiene is the most crucial and often provide a starting point for developing a culture of quality improvement in health facilities. You know, but the problem is despite of all these evidence you know which is gathering, only 50% of the countries report having a national IPC program or a plan or related guidelines. That is overall, you know, when we are talking about the global scenario. But if it comes to the low medium income countries, it is even more alarming, where only 15% have a system 
to assess their compliance and effectiveness. So, you know, but at the same time, fortunately, in the last few years, the socioeconomic and also the behavioral sciences have played an, a, a good role and uh, greatly contributed to the fight against uh, healthcare associated infections by identifying barriers and facilitators for the implementation of infection prevention and control measures. Um, you know, post COVID, now we all know that, you know, you all have actually experienced it, that now more and more we are tasked with increased visibility and also the accountability to meet the multitude of challenges affiliated with uh, HAIs. It is no more, uh, means when we talk about IP as a profession, it is no more a part-time or a shared position. It is a full-time job where, you know, it also uh, involves actually us into patient safety and infection prevention improvement initiatives, uh, antimicrobial stewardship, uh, strategies for addressing new and emerging uh, pathogens, and also po possibly the uh, the future pandemics, um, the surveillance of infection uh, prevention and control practices, the compliance with healthcare regulations. You know, I can go on, but the point is the IPs, that is, infection preventionists, are tasked with more and more, uh, you know, tasks in order to um, improve uh, the healthcare system overall. Now, post COVID, now the question is the IPC momentum, which has been built during this pandemic, will it be sustainable? And will the government and healthcare workers and other stakeholders prioritize evidence-based infection prevention measures for improving quality care or not? That is what is to be seen. And uh, during the next uh, five sessions in this uh, series, uh, the experts, uh, expert IPC practitioners who are on the ground would be bringing their perspectives and they would be discussing in detail in order to understand uh, how do we move ahead, uh, how, how do we build evidence in order to have a proper infection prevention and control in our healthcare systems. So thank you very much for um, joining us. And uh, I hope, you know, we are going to have a real festive season once again. Now, let me, um, you know, take the opportunity uh, to uh, introduce the today's uh, eminent speaker, uh, Dr. Nirav Pandya. Uh, Dr. Nirav, uh, thank you very much. You know, despite of uh, uh, your illness, you know, uh, you have joined, you know, your enthusiasm is really contagious. Thank you. Uh, thanks a ton for joining us today, uh, despite all the difficulty. Now, introducing Dr. No uh, Dr. Nirav. Dr. Nirav Pandya is MD in microbiology and uh, he is certified in infection control from um, CBIC, uh, that is uh, United States of America. He is the clinical microbiologist and HOD division of microbiology and molecular testing of uh, Dr. Udayan's laboratory, Vadodara. Uh, Dr. Nirav has also qualified in IDCC from uh, PD Hinduja uh, Hospital, Mumbai, CCIDC, ISCCM, um, you know, and an infection control uh, fellow course from ITSA, that is. Uh, uh, Infectious Disease uh, Society of uh, America. And, uh, you know, he also has done several courses from uh, London School of uh, Hygiene and Preventive Medicine. He is a NABH and CAHO assessor with expertise in bacteriology, mycobacteriology, mycology, molecular testing, RT-PCR, etc., etc. He has numerous publications, both in international and also the national journals, with more than 712 citations for his public, uh, published work. So uh, Dr. Nero, thanks once again for joining us. And the floor is yours, Doctor. Dr. Nero? Uh, yes, sir. 
डॉक्टर सर या फ्लोर इज योर डॉक्टर अच्छा रे एपोलॉजी सर माय वीडियो इज नॉट वर्किंग फॉर सम फॉर सम रीजंस बट इन द लास्ट दिस लेट्स गो अहेड विद द प्रेजेंटेशन आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक डॉक्टर रंगारेड्डी सर इफका एंड साइमेड फॉर गिविंग दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू शेयर माय व्यूज ऑन द टॉपिक एंड सो बेसिकली दिस इज मास्टर क्लास 5 so already most of the uh, most of the topics are over here already been covered in our previous four uh, series so this session i think would be more kind of brush up of this knowledge plus going one step further to utilize this previous knowledge we have gathered so this topic are bit different like the uh, today's topic is kind of prioritizing ibc practices so we know the basics we assume that we know the basics and thus when we want to apply this knowledge to prioritize various practices in our setups so that can uh, so let me start with my presentation please doctor okay is it visible the screen is yeah okay great so to, uh, to you can uh, make it full screen okay so i'll be talking about this priorities for improving infection prevention and control so this my this is theme is is priorities and evidence practices for ipc so i will be talking about priorities for the session so i'm dr nirav pandya i'm md microbiology i've done the cic i'm working as a clinical microbiologist and infection preventionist with various institutes i've also done some of the courses like a certified infection control infection control fellow course in usa i have been working experience of experience for almost 11 years with various institute like max hospital wacard pilot i mean and all that so we will be covering this topic under the three main headings core component of ipc as described by who high priority ipc areas and lastly i implementing facility specific ipc priorities so going ahead with the core component of ipc as we most of them are uh, uh, aware what are the core component of ipc the who have recently updated this guideline and given the eight core component for any ipc program core component one ipc program two ipc guideline ipc training education surveillance multimodal strategies uh, monitoring audit and feedback workload staffing and other uh, environment and equipment for the ipc we will just briefly cover up all these uh, components what are what is the basically salient feature of this component so all these component is all these seven eight components are basically part of this multimodal strategy includes ipc program animal environment core are the guidelines education training surveillance and audit and feedback but for all this we require a good leadership from the infection prevention as well as the hospital side to lead this ipc program core component 1 is basically in what is say is evidence so evidence is showing that ipc program include dedicated and trained professional are effective in reducing hi in acute care facilities so evidence is there when ipc program is robust professional are trained it definitely reduces overall hi in the hospital but it requires clearly defined objective functional functions dedicated and trained ipc staff and multidisciplinary team support from facility leadership more crucial and good quality microbiology laboratory to support this hi surveillance activities on them so this is core component 1 which which, which normally encompasses encompasses ipc program activities core component 2 it includes ipc guideline again the what what who is uh, concluded that evidence shows the guideline and implementation of this guideline actually reduces the risk of hi uh, hi for the patient but again for the expertise is required to prepare this guideline we need to locally prioritize the area which we required for which we required to guideline and implement it provide resources for implementation like training material and what is required education and monitoring of implementation is required so i the more component 2 is the ipc guideline ipc 3 is again this is uh, one step further than the ipc guideline so we require ipc education and training it facility level and national level guidelines should be education should be promoted again evidence show that ipc education 
involves frontline healthcare work in a practical and hands-on approach. Incorporate individual experiences is associated with reduced HI and increased hand hygiene compliance. So basically, they are they are the robust studies they have taken. Again, the training can be either pre-graduate, post-graduate, or in service training. Evaluation of the training impact is required, and collaboration with local academic institutes is required. So these are uh, the with the very similar the training where series that is conducted by IIFI. This kind of one got similar uh, exam example of this collaboration of between institutes. Core component four HI surveillance. Again, HI surveillance uh, showed that lead to a decrease in HI. Plus timely feedback influence the implementation effective IPC excel. Most common example is the hand hygiene. Hand hygiene feedback uh, you, timely uh, should be given to the uh, the healthcare worker. For it, we require standardized definition for HI surveillance, approved meth method, and good microbiology lab support and quality control of this laboratory uh, setup required. Plus training expertise in interpretation of HI definition. Core component five. Basically, this is like a multi-modal strategy. What it says, Kevin, it implementing IPC activity at facility level using multi-modal strategies. It effective to improve IPC practice and reduce HI. So, we're using multi-modal strategies is one of the things which we require the multiple strategies. We don't need to follow a single strategy like training. We need to incorporate all the strategies. So, first of all, it should be built it for any kind of change. We require the five steps. First, we will build it, build the change system should be there. We need proper guideline program should be there. We need to teach this change, teach the training and education. Check what is the way guideline, what is the, whether this training is uh, actually fruitful to the ground level or system is working. And sell it. We need to come cover. Sell it means in, in kind of term marketing, term, it's called sell it. You need to sell your product. You need to sell your uh, policies or guideline. So for that, you need to use constant reminder and communication with the healthcare worker. It is not that once you educate and monitor, it will get implemented. You need to constantly remind them. And finally, leave it. So ultimately, what they work at, it becomes the culture. And everyone starts to leave the uh, culture change. This kind of, we are talking about the safety culture. So for this, we require multidisciplinary team. We require everyone for the infection control, for hospital management, for nursing staff, to the HR person. We all this for the implementation. We consider a range of strategies that target different influencers of human behavior like monitoring and feedback, infrastructure, organization, culture, that everything matters for the ultimate implementation of multimodal strategies. Component six, monitoring and audit of IPC practice and feedback. Again, when, we, when you're giving regular monitoring and uh, auditing of the IPC practice with the regular feedback, it, it increase the adherence to the practices, plus reducing overall HI rate. This is required to achieve behavior change or other process modification and also to document progress and impact. You need to document it so that you know so to what percentage you are you are on the right track or improvement is there. Core command staff uh, seven, this is called a crucial point, uh, workload staffing and bad occupancy at facility level. Bad occupancy, what WHO says bad occupancy exceeding the standard capacity will increase the risk, increase the risk of HI. And in addition, it is in inadequate mental work at staffing level. Uh, the standard for bed occupancy should be one patient per bed with adequate spacing between beds. So, like a minimum one meter bed spacing should be there. In pandemic, there were certain areas, certain hospital uh, where the spacing was uh, much of the issue. But this is kind of rare scenario. This is a pandemic scenario. Otherwise, routinely there should be minimum one meter space between patient. And the staffing should be the matching with the overall capacity of the wards. This so this could be important. This core component influences implementation of all other core component. So staffing, if, if if staffing is a deranged, it is going to definitely affect all the levels of the uh, other component. Like in COVID, we you know the staffing was a major issue. So we all, all we have seen this overall IPC practice compliance was very less. Initial phase hand hygiene was higher due to fear. But apart from that, there was no compliance was very less. In high, HI was higher increase in COVID patient. We also seen this mucormycosis increase. So this all staffing is the crucial point. And there are some one WHO is given a wonderful technique. Like w, they, given the WISM model, WINS model. So HR people can use this um, WINS model. This is available on the in, internet. There is one fraternity or forum is also there that guides the hospital to plan the uh, the, uh, the healthcare worker requirement. They can, they, this model, this method also gives them some backup or a backup or cushion for the extra staff. They also prepare the hospital staff, hospital for the 
requirement of extra staff in case of emergency. So this method can be used to calculate the uh, staffing requirement. And so eight component, building a build environment, material and equipment IPC at facility level. Again, what we have to see, we have to make, make the equipment and product available at the point of care, point of care. Like we need to make the aware, uh, make available hand, hand drop at the point bad side, at as near to the bad side as possible. It increases compliance. This is practical experience we are all are aware of. Again, ready availability and supplement placement of hand hygiene material and equipment. In case, uh, it increases compliance and uh, to the hand hygiene. Plus, appropriate cleaning and hygienic environment, wash services and material availability should be there. The proper compliance to the all the cleaning protocol and disinfection services. So these are the core components of IPC. Now what we this we you know the eight core components for the uh, WHO. Now we have to select high priorities IPC area. Uh, basically there are plenty of core components, but we need to select high priorities. Uh, how can we select high priorities? So there are plenty of IPC practices are there, like surveillance, hepatitis B and C vaccination, illness injury. Community against engagement, occupational health, media, policy, wars, all things are there. But we need to prioritize rights. Now, how we can prioritize rights, at least especially in our resource limited setting? So, there was a study conducted by uh, in the ACMID in 2016, in which they asked for all these uh, their interesting premier studies to, to prioritize uh, their in in what they're in uh, side their opinion, uh, the, their view on priorities of IPC area. What was the result? Was there? How many in European eyes division is in their uh, said uh, in their opinion microbiology epidemiology or resistance is the highest priority. We can we can we, we or certainly similar find of finding surveillance followed by decolonization, antiseptic use, organism behavior changes, number specific HKI as far well as in the setting like uh, we require some uh, the microbiotic we need a specific setup. I'm sorry, uh, can you all please, please mute yourself so that Uma Chandran, Uma Chandran, Uma Chandran, yeah, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so these are the top seven priorities areas given as per the survey. Okay, normally, economical, like the initial points, initial are two to three, I think, more relevant to us. But again, as I said, Europeans are normally they are very developed countries, their priorities can be different. So what I feel is that we need certain high priorities as per our setup. That this kind of basic uh, basic things we require: structured IPC program, hand hygiene, transmission based precaution, bundle care approach, wash, uh, disinfection, sterilization, HI surveillance, antibiotics. So these are the kind of eight things priorities that for which pertinent to our our Indian setup. So just briefly going uh, this of these all all eight point require separate uh, topic or separate lecture to address everything. But just not going to very depth and just going brushing out just on the superficially for all the important I just giving you the important points of these points. Structure IPC program, what is the priority requirements? We require IPC program with a dedicated and trained IPC team in hospital, plus a functioning infection control committee, just not on a paper, but it's all office uh, HSA is functional. Whether it is my meeting monthly or three months, it is not very important, but at least it should be there, it should be functioning, and someone should be the answerable. The IPC program should have clearly defined objective and a new work plan based on local epidemiology and priority areas. So we need to define the objective. If we want to improve our hand hygiene by 10% by the end of this year, so that is when we need to reduce our clepsy by 50% by the end of this year. This, this will target or objective should be clearly defined. IPC policies, evidence-based guidelines should be developed and implemented. Again, this policy should be evidence-based, should be I think, some good reference from either CDC or WHO, not any kind of opinion-based, but should be evidence-based. Like any of this, all these policies should be followed by IPC education and training along with the new employee orientation or induction training, plus followed by the provision of continuous education opportunity at least yearly to the all level of hospital staff not only a nursing or particularly but whether, whether it is the healthcare manager or nursing doctor at least annual training should be there so we this all this cover the all three core component of the who the structure ips program second hand hygiene not going to very depth but just what, what we need to for emphasize is on the five component of who multimodal strategy for hand hygiene improvement first of all is the required system change the alcohol based hand should be available at the point of care. System change uh, plus access to safe and continuous water supply or soap and towel. 
so either hand drum or water supply soap and towel should be available as in last as we know last day, during last covid there are plenty of companies which have to pop up with the alcohol based hand drum to for a, as an infection prevention to be all our duty is to be able to ensure and ensure the quality of the hand drum hand drum product so that so that we need uh, compliance can be increased and it can be consistent plus so the system chain availability of hand drum and supply supply chain and training education of staff evaluation and feedback hand hygiene audited and feedback reminder in the workplace for a five hours of hand hygiene and, and when to do the hand hygiene reminders and ultimately lead to institute the safety and climates so this is the safe for hand hygiene at least this should be uh, this should be our priority transmission based just a briefing what we what i feel can normally contain plenty of content application we are under so for covid we know i think it is we have everyone is aware of the isolation precaution but for indian setup for hospital setup this contact precaution is very important especially for the mdr bacteria we have seen the plenty of cross transmission of bacteria in the icu patient so for the early we should be able to give contact precaution for mdr patient having the mdr i think infection or colonization patient can be keep in a single room or cot with the same patient like patient having the cr eclapsia we can cover them or we can cover the staff for them plus uh, so for the gloves and gowns should be required for the staff not any like any not just kind of coating of the patient or staff so that they don't transmit uh, cross transmit the bacteria plus hiv hiv dysentery we not droplet h1n1 influenza mumps rubella covid very uh, the droplet can be it could be aerosol spread so single covered patient no required for negative pressure airborne pulmonary tb in measles chicken pox sorry for the spelling and the uh, single with negative pressure negative pressure room is required with n95 so n95 is required for the airmo precaution not for the droplet protective all these neutropenic immunocompromised patient chemotherapy aids patient we require single room with positive pressures so that we need to at least emphasize on at least some of the at least contact precaution area if we make it a priority so when uh, so when there is no tb no negative pressure room is available for tb or the what way, what can be done if this is setup is limited no negative hepi available you can keep a make shift arrangement like of making the room negative pressure by keeping a exhaust fan uh, exhaust fan so that air at least we can at least control the air direction the air will be coming from outside and is the patient air and it goes through out the window so at least by by another mean we can try to create some negative pressure or negative air flow now bundle care approach we know bundle is a kind of set of uh, practices evidence based practices which group when group together give the better result than the single practice the bundle care approach approach why this important the direct benefits are shorter icu stay reduce final cost improve resource utilization but it, and it is very economical for resource poor setting to improve patient outcome and curtailing hi so bundle care one of the great practices or one of the most cost effective practices for the improving hi improving hi rate so commonly or at least the basic that should be followed of web bundle epilepsy bundle sepsis resuscitation or management bundle more important for the icu patient potty prevention and ssa preventive bundle so this bundle practice should be at least uh, minimal this uh, should be implemented by the priority Then wash. What is wash? So wash is a basically a term common UNICEF. It is used for the water, sanitation, and hygiene. So this uh, part is all is important of all for the community acquired infection in the community as well as equally important in the hospital setup to maintain this wash proper. So for, for water, we need to ensure to give the proper drinking water to the patient as well as our staff. Our water, when you if you are using, it should be in comply with the proper no in comply with the norms. dm water when used for dialysis it should be having the proper unit to check it properly with endotoxin and culture and all the chemical parameters for sanitation id we need to ensure proper cleaning of the areas as it is been evident removing pathogen from high into surfaces is more likely to have impact on transmission than cleaning of inaccessible and low to surfaces so normally when uh, we ask for the routine cleanings the cleaning of high to surfaces is enough the deep cleaning for the inaccessible surface can be done in special case like after the discharge of the infected patient otherwise so routinely high to surfaces cleaning is i think sufficient frequency of cleaning is still no uh, there is no standardized guideline available for frequency of cleaning but we can define as per our protocol icu like we can go for three times or four times a day what if we have one two times a day 
but there, there is no clinical evidence is available for at least free, uh, to define the exact frequency for the clinic so we require we need to provide the standard screening protocol for all the uh, all, all the hospital area different areas it should be followed universally universally like preparation of proper dilution of what product should be used in which areas and uh, what is the contact time that is uh, our job to give them the this protocol training protocol should be uh, followed by training of the housekeeping staff for the proper following uh, follow up this protocol and regular monitoring of any feedback so cleaning efficacy monitoring should be done uh, and, and uh, mostly by the visual method or direct checklist so what we can we can also prepare some kind of this kind of checklist like the more deep cleaning or terminal cleaning in icu and ward we can just point on a high high touch surfaces and then there's someone go from the either housekeeping or supervisor can go go uh, go to the area check them visibly and uh, give the feedback to the staff or health officer immediately and follow the fogging there is the one fogging is we or we all are fogging is now not not that much no that not at all recommended so there is a chronology of cdc recommendation for the fogging in 2003 the again uh, the guidelines were do not perform fogging for routine purpose in patient care area 2008 the same was repeated but again the def, uh, category of recommendation was downgraded from 1b to uh, category 2 2011 uh, there is the more the, there was guideline for the norovirus for the cdc so again they do not commit and they just give the more resources required to clarify effectiveness of fogging to reduce uh, norovirus contamination so as you can see the cdc has actually in fact they diluted their strongness of uh, rec for recommendation against fogging initially they are very strong against with the category 1b gradually they come to category 2 and they uh, finally get the no recommendation but uh, practically and theoretically we can speaking fogging can be done only for the patient with having the airborne the airborne infection like fogging we need to do to clean the air so like fish and the tb influenza are uh, not required that much for uh, unless aerosol is generated chicken pox measles any special cases and instead we should be emphasizing more on the deep cleaning in routine uh, for everywhere whether it is ot or icu everywhere fogging is practically not recommended and not at all practically very useful so better to emphasize so uh, deep cleaning and ask the staff to go for the deep cleaning in a more comprehensive way disinfection sterilization just briefing on few of the important points so we also need to define disinfection protocol for each reusable item and instrument whether it is in the ot or in the icu in the ward so we need to give them the protocol for how to disinfect the item now, either proper, uh, proper cleaning is required before autoclave, ET or high level disinfection, disinfection. So what is normally the perception in the doctor's mind, doctor's clinician's mind is that when you subject anything for ET or autoclave, it normally gets sterile. We don't need to do anything else. And we can do any uh, do all the items with the ETO. So we need to uh, convey the message that the, the proper cleaning process is important. If the item cannot be cleaned properly, it cannot be st uh, made sterile properly. So item that cannot be cleaned, should not be, should not be subjective to the ET or autoclave or a high level disinfection. The monitoring of sterilization process is also very crucial. The sterilization process we have seen uh, normally uh, there's multiple parameters can be used for the either physical testing, chemical, physical parameters or the chemical indicators or biological indicator. The, the process monitoring is very important. We need to put this uh, CSA person in, in charge for that to keep the, all this in chemical indicator in OT trace and do the use for use the biological indicator for the ETU items and autoclave. Also, we need to define the reuse policy uh, for at least for the uh, setup having like cardiac uh, cardiology setup. Uh, some of the areas are like in the endoscopy area where this reuse is common. So we need to give the reuse policy. We have to define this number of reuse along with the along with the uh, consulting with our uh, clinician friends for the maximum number of reuse where can we do how to clean it how to mark it and how to trace it so there's a point important for the disinfection sterilization you know, hi surveillance hi surveillance is basically it is our most high priority areas so we also need to uh, take the prioritization exercise to determine which hi to target for surveillance according to local con local contacts so we need to define our HI, which HI is more common in our setup, I need to target them. So the HI survey could either be facility-wide, which we can be total and comprehensive, monitoring all patient care areas for all HIs, but it is extremely labor intensive and useful efforts for very small facility like 100 to 200 bedded hospital can be, but along, we can be used for a bigger hospital, but we require a large pool of infection control nurse for their staff for that. 
while targeted the target are chosen as the risk of acid risk assessment either unit based or infection based i require fewer resources like suppose we have seen ke seen our one icu acetyl bacter web is getting increased so we need to target this web in this icu so we also need to can be target acetyl bacter for all the facility or we see cover in our hospital cardiothoracic surgery is high so we need to target this area this uh, kind of surgery is high this high risk areas so this is kind of targeted intra hsa surveillance simplest form of surveillance is either we if you don't have you don't have any resources at all you can you can just start with the mortality or readmission rate after surgical procedure or after or after the icu admission periodic point prevalence survey can be done for, to note the actual point prevalence of any kind of infection we require train the train the person for surveys and pilot surveys to validate for same protocol can be done so when you implementing some new protocol like we are having some new product for the hand 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 scrub so we can do the which a pilot survey to validate this uh, use whether it is the effective or not type of hi cd says gain more than 40 type of hi we can no need to monitor everything it is web uh, or va event a uh, web or va e event, uh, so event can be monitor corti clepsi surgical sign infection hospital acquired pneumonia and others can be monitor so, but we need to again follow this under this definition like cd is getting uh, is give the updated guidelines every Jan every january we need to follow this guideline uh, for evidence base Now, along with the surveys, let me let's start the alma 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 surveys alma alma culture. What are the normally case guidelines say about uh, guys surveys cultures? So, category one B recommendations are do not uh, conduct random or undirected microbiological sampling of air, water, and surfaces in the healthcare facility. So, it is with against the routine surveillance. When indicated, conduct microbiological sampling as part of an epidemiologic investigation only to for a kind of uh, to sub find out then out uh, the kind of outbreak investigation. A limit microbiological survey sampling for COVID as soon as purpose only, like monthly culture of water and dialysis at a hemodialysis unit, and short-term evaluation of the impact of any infection control measures or change in infection control protocol. So, for this, suppose we have changed some uh, flow or disinfection solution, so we can go for the at least uh, some random or short-term uh, surface culture for that to show this is this impact. So, apart from there is no recommendation for regular like weekly or monthly OT cultures and all that. Uh, otherwise, we need to be other. Uh, so the only exception if you are we are finding something specific thing antibiotic stores see this is really very priority for our indian setup we cannot conclude without this so normally uh, this this all these trial is the trial is their uh, hii surveillance of antibiotic resistant and antibiotic consumption and cumulative antibiogram hospital should we should be having the antibiogram cumulative antibiogram followed with the antibiotic policy and antibiotic stores program So suppose what if hospital does not have this anti-cumulative antibiogram? So recently, I think before a couple of uh, last week only, ICMR has published the uh, new or last uh, 2021 annual report. That is, we can take the support of these annual or local uh, data and make antibody policy accordingly. So that's why if uh, suppose if hospital does not have an actual proper antibiogram, then there is the way of uh, way out of that. This we can use this guideline. So seven elements for the as a normally we can any any antibody stewardship program for any antibody stewardship program we need leadership commitment commitment from the leadership accountability we need to appoint a leader or co-leader either physician or pharmacist for the program management outcome pharmacy expertise is very critical clinical pharmacist appointment is a very useful or not more than useful it is very helpful for the program action like implementing intervention prospect audit and feedback is important action followed by tracking of this. Antibody prescription, intervention, and other outcome like CD infection or resistant pattern, MDR or resistant pattern can be tracked. Reporting, regular reporting from antibody use to the prescriber. So we need to give feedback to the doctors to, for the better improvement. The continued education should be continued for all, all level of staff. So this core and core element is required for the any antibody stewardship program. ASP common strategies there are plenty of strategies which are planned not plenty, but few of the strategies are mentioned in the literature. The common that we can use is either prospective audit and feedback and formulate instruction. As per my experience, prospective audit and feedback is one of the excellent strategy that can be is uh, actually a very fruitful result. It is a, with the sustained result, along with the formulate instruction, can be clubbed with this prospective audit and feedback. This, uh, this kind of list that we used to follow, we used to carry antibiotic like carapinam, higher and gram negative antibiotic, gram positive, anti-fungal. So what we used to use, uh, what we used to do is. 
we follow this anti antibiotic for restriction plus audit and feedback so this kind of very good strategy and we have good result so in what we just what it in, in, uh, what it incorporate is normally give the uh, give the right drug right dose at the right time the right duration of patient after antibiotic wait for the 48 hours okay, see the result and i i the stop change or oral switch the patient or oral switch to the lower spectrum antibiotic and continue reviewing so we need to do this kind of uh, continuous uh, monitoring of the antibiotic usage surgical again we need to monitor surgery so we should not skip out um, or miss out the surgical profile again should be at least given on this only single dose within 60 minutes before knife to the before before incision and we need to we also need to incorporate one important point is that if surgery is i think extending beyond 4 hour or if blood loss is more than 1500 ml so the, the antibiotic dose should be repeated so this point is normally gets missed out in our antibiotic policy and we can incorporate that and finally we'll just few of the slides for how to implement these all these high priorities in our uh, facility specific prior to define these priorities so what are the challenges this core component all are there but what are challenges that we face normally in our resource limited settings in our indian service scenario so in india we have kind of multiple kind of organization multiple we have kind of two division one kind of big corporate hospital we don't have any resource limited plus one having the um, middle level hospital or we we they have much kind of distance for the resources so for them we have limited access to qualified and trained ipc professional limited human resources for the icn and all the trained staff inadequate budget for the dedicated budget for the infection control implementation the challenges for uh, for this practices so we need to uh, need uh, adapt and tailor to local cultural setting local context and according to all the resources for that our limited of training staff for the hr human resources quality microbiology laboratories uh, support is required and uh, again it these kind of one of the major, major like area that we face we don't have any kind of proper it or data management system which help us in requirement of surveillance and auditing there are some of the softwares are there but uh, they are very uh, very primitive states so we don't have proper good support of uh, like cdc have this nhs system but we don't have such kind of system in india so we have to do all these thing manually it is very labor intensive so how to setting a priorities in our our hospital so, so the all the ibs program should be reviewed periodically at least annually and during this review we need to set as well review our priorities so, so we should plan to identify priority area of healthcare to be taken in any phase manner and also incorporate we need to target our priorities at the three item three terms short term three term what's a priority medium term what's a priority long term what's a priority the short term like we can a target like hand age we want to increase by 10% by vigorous training and feedback medium term we want to improve our oral cleaning uh, cleaning protocol and cleaning efficacy with the training and continuous uh, monitoring long term like here we need to reduce our wrap rate for, for the overall period so this kind of target or priorities we can set as plus in a phase manner the program to assess course can monitor on a monthly basis on interest monitor meeting so when we meet the interest monitor committee meeting in monthly we need to monitor this progress toward this all the priorities and setting clear priorities of measurement and improvement you need to set the clear priorities so that we can measure our improvement and the process for the to the setting a priority what the leaders of our interest leaders of the organization with interest prevention it so we would review external requirement as well as the in internal measurement like priorities from external requirement like government regulation accreditation requirement like nabs requirement pollution control board rules we need to incorporate these as well plus what is the internal requirement like include the service uh, which are we need to target what the service we need to improve like suppose we want to improve our surgical care so the surgical should be in our tier priority sir medical staff concerns like doctor some doctors are telling you in our hospital or icu we hospital upon pneumonia is higher so hospital upon pneumonia should be covered into the high priority and clinic that represent high risk or high volume services that warrant monitoring uh, there is a total high and volume service like one surgical or surgery is high we need to target that a uh, high risk suppose we have the high uh, through dialysis uh, center so dialysis so are high priority areas so once priorities are defined the organization leaders then select the performance measures can begin so we need to select performance measure all quality indicators as per the our uh, priority areas so the, the, the example of this kind of measure i hand aging apply using who more tool center line care and insertion follies catheter insertion surgical site prevention mdr transmission monitoring and the prevention 
cleaning efficacy disinfection consumption of alcohol based hand rub and consumption of antibiotics this is just kind of indicative list we need to set such kind of indicative objective measurement to to focus so finally all the for this what we required we required engagement of leadership development of program and implementation of the prior areas in priority for that we require resources assessment and strengthening budget allocation engagement to other healthcare workers and bringing ownership of this all the processes and identify the outcome indicators so this from the so from setting of the priorities we need to how we need to measure the outcome by use of the outcome indicators so for this we required again as i told you multi modal strategy we require so for me need to build the system change we need to teach to the, the educate all this education monitoring and feedback goes in the surveillance and fear, monitoring or audit feedback reminder and safety climate change the way we need to leave it so in basically the ips program so this complete overall multi modal strategies for implementing success of our areas finally concluding few of the just uh, perspective of uh, so prioritization is the key in resource limited setting but we need we need to convince that convince uh, the leadership that resource invested in ips are worth the net gain irrespective of the context and the despite the cost incurred whatever you invest it kind of gives pay pays you in the long run not all solution require additional resources and some of the solutions are very low, low cost that can be implemented readily like if it is not feasible we need to collaborate uh, for the better achievement of the core component delivery and funding and again policies are there everything is there but implementation is the key we need to transfer our job is to transform policy to practice it is not always easy and time consuming we need to prioritize and go for the step wise multi modal multi dispatch strategies are required we we need to devise our policy and a people centric integrated with clinical procedure in innovative solution can be uh, think of to, for the better implementation okay thanks a lot everyone for this session i'm open for the questions thanks thank you very much uh, dr nirav for that uh, very comprehensive presentation uh, which has probably covered 360 degree of ipc uh, you know especially you know your concluding slide uh, is very very important in terms of uh, emphasizing on the fact that you know implementation is the key uh, we have so many uh, guidelines now available uh both from the world health organization cdc uh you know various other organizations including our ncdc icmr etc etc so policies are there probably uh now we know um you know from uh, what you mentioned in your presentation also uh by now we know what are the priority areas you know uh we have adequate probably uh knowledge you know i am not talking about actually uh, experience but the knowledge on what are the priority areas you know how to uh, probably go about them what are the requirements etc uh, etc et i think you know you have covered very beautifully uh, all those things you know a very very informative presentation <clears throat> and one more thing you know probably uh, i would like to emphasize once again what you said um, in terms of the outcome indicators at the end of the day anything what we do uh, it had to have the right kind of outcome which is very important you know uh, for us because you know we need to uh, get that satisfaction of doing something and also seeing the uh, outcomes of you know whatever we are doing that is one part of it to you know to also build the enthusiasm in the team you know among all the healthcare workers and third probably is also to showcase to the management that you know there could be uh, a realistic kind of outcomes which are going to enhance uh, the quality uh, system or the quality uh, kind of outcomes uh, which is going to probably uh, help the management also to uh, take proper decisions in terms of uh investments in terms of actually the people deployment other resource deployment etc etc a wonderful presentation thank you dr nero um i think uh, 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 uh i'm just looking at you know if there are any questions in that box uh 
I don't see them. If any of you have got any uh, questions, please raise your hand and then, you know, or, you know, you can put them into the chat box so that, you know, we can uh, request Dr. Nira to uh, bring, uh, bring, you know, further perspectives into those uh, areas. Uh, I see, you know, a couple of them uh, in uh, queue. Just let me see. Are there anyone, uh, you know, who want to ask any question? You can unmute yourself and, you know, ask the question. Or post it in uh, the chat box. Okay. Okay, great. I think, you know, there are no questions. That means there are uh, two things. Either, you know, they understood everything Hello. or they haven't understood Hello. everything. Sir, I just wanted to know sir, about I the, uh, know about the uh, fumigation of fumigation critical, of critical areas, areas like, like ICUs. ICUs. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, just basically fumigation or fogging is not much recommended for any kind of critical areas, whether it is OT or ICU. Unless you are in the patient of tuberculosis and getting discharged, so you may think of go for fogging for that. Or second is if your ICU is getting out of this construction, you suspect there is there may be there may can be fungal spore in the air. So in that case, uh, you can go for the fogging for that. Plus, plus uh, and then make sure that yeah, fogging is. Uh, it should be followed up, followed up, uh, it should be for uh, deep cleaning should be that before going with the fogging. So deep cleaning and fogging should be good together when you go for fogging. It is very limited setting. Life you are having the tuberculosis or aspergillosis, uh, you, you have multiple patients with aspergillus uh, in the outbreak is there. You are having this uh, construction activities go, going on and it's getting over. Seeing, apart from there, I don't see any rationally for the uh, fogging in any other areas, in the ICU especially. Thank you, sir. Sure. Uh, I see, you know, two more hands uh, raising uh, Chintu Kalpana. Please go ahead, madam. Kalpana, please go ahead with your question. Unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Anamika Vyas, uh, you have raised the hand. Please go ahead with uh, your question. Good afternoon, sir. Doctor, you just said that fogging can be done when the renovation somewhere is misused or OTs or if a patient is getting discharged. So, so my query is that should we go for fogging the typical IPDs that are having some open could not hear it properly, but actually, what I understood what normally you are asking about the discharge of the tuberculosis patient, right? Okay, okay, okay. So, what can be done? Can normally what tuberculosis open cox patient or open cox patient or open cox patient is there? We need to follow negative pressure is negative pressure is not that before taking another patient to his air is clean. Is airborne, right? Is airborne, right? So, for fogging, so for is, fogging I recommend to go for the fogging. Is required. Uh, doctor, one more question, you know, coming from Anand Janagon, you know, again, the same question is fogging recommended for what is periodically uh, for wards admitting TB patients? I think, you know, you answered, maybe, you know, you can emphasize once again, I think yes. it is a question, yes. you know, many people have in I decided, I decided. Yes, I yes. The fogging is kind of one of the things that I can after I can go for the fogging ward, what do you recommend for me? So we need to first take our calm ground. Deep feeling is proper. No required for any kind of fogging. The only exception is when you are having this carbon injection. Absolutely. Uh, one more from uh, Dr. Anamika Vyas. Targeted surveillance. Can you elaborate a little more? Right, right. The target is the means of what do you, what is the target is, what I mean was we want to go for risk assessment. 
रिस्क असेसमेंट ऑफ वेरियस एरियाज ओके वरना देयर इज वन और टू गाइडलाइंस आर अवेलेबल गाइडलाइंस आर अवेलेबल इन व्हिच दे गिव द इंटरेस्ट कोड टू एक्सेस कोड टू सो यू कैन यूज दिस गाइडलाइन गो फॉर आवर एसेसमेंट यू कैन डिफाइन योर प्रायोरिटीज एंड योर एरिया एरिया हाई रिस्क एक्टिविटी लाइक सपोज यू आर हॉस्पिटल इज एंड वी मोर काइंड ऑफ Uh, more ICU yeah, capacity, yeah, more ICU surgical ICU. So you can target some areas like uh, some areas like surgical patients. Uh, surgical patients. So we need to define our uh, target. We need to audit, audit. In this kind of particular kind area of or ICU or ICU or particular activity. Particular activity. So you need to go for the risk assessment, the risk assessment, the risk assessment data. Please, uh, uh, you can go for the, all these documentation review. Your last year data. Last year data. You see that your your fertility is high in one IC. You can target as many as you want for this IC. That's the point. That's the point. Maybe one last question we will take um, from Alin Vitas. Uh, she is asking fogging. Or UV, which is better method of uh, disinfection for OT. This is like my voice is I think equal. My voice is I think equal. Yes, yes uh, fogging, yes. fogging or ultraviolet, uh, which is better method of disinfection. Yes, that is what is the question from Ali. Hello, can you hear, uh, Doctor? Hi, am I audible now? Yeah, there is Hi, a question. Yeah, there is a question. uh between fogging and uv which is the better method of disinfection for ot operation the fogging or ot they say you have fogging and uv light they say you have fogging and uv light okay that's interesting question UV, yeah. normally yeah. i think for uv basically it is one kind of audited one kind of audited fogging is kind of not is not getting audited while one is actually very one is actually very they suddenly don't have any studies for the uv light for the uv light So you will light. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Yes. Actually, yes. the voice is breaking, sir. It is echoing, sir. We can't hear the answers properly. The answers properly. Just a second. Hello. Okay. Hello. Uh, just a second. Just a second. Hello. 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 Yes, doctor. Go ahead. Is am I audible now? Clearly audible. Clearly audible. Yes, yes. If you could uh, uh, speak from the uh, mic a little nearer to the mic, probably that would be okay. 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 So basically, as I, uh, I, was, I was telling. Telling. There is one you fogging and you like this kind of two different modalities. Modalities. Fogging is not a very outdated method. Right. While UV is kind of much newer, we don't have any much recommendation, recommendation or much evidence for, for the UV light. So yeah, especially for OT, especially for OT, I think you know the uh, guidelines or the available evidence for the UV uh, in OT, uh, it is very limited. But yes, I think you know it has got its own place. I am, I am sure yes. you know as the evidence is going to gather, probably it could. Uh, become an alternate to obsolete process called as fogging. I think you know that is what uh, probably probably agree. is the answer to that question. Do you agree, doctor? Nira? I agree, I agree, sir. But I agree, sir. So only the problem, only the problem, only the problem. We need to ensure that this is all the areas. All the areas. So for this logistic or practical issue is there for each implementation. So technical it is excellent. Just purely for implementation. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nira. Thank you all the friends. You know, if you still have more questions, uh, please uh, write to us. Um, you know, we are going to have as uh, a conclusion to this series um, a panel discussion. Uh, which is going to be moderated by Professor Shamana. So all those questions, you know, which are not being answered, or you know, you would get further questions, you can keep posting to us, and we will try and get all the answers possible uh, through the great panelists, you know, expert panelists, you know, who are going to participate in the last. And uh, please ensure that um, uh, you are going to attend to all the uh, five sessions. 
so that you know you can get uh, your certificate and uh, please ensure that you know you are going to uh, join in time and you know keep your mics muted so that you know everybody can enjoy um, the academic feast you know which is being actually given by uh, the expert uh, uh, speakers here once again thank you very much uh, to all of you who have joined today for this very interesting session which was delivered by dr uh, pandya and we look forward to see you again next tuesday at 3 30. thank you thank you sir thank you 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 th